Okay, uh, this is Thursday, August the 20th, a recorded interview with John Perkins, the former economic hitman, and John Kiriakou, the whistleblower from the CIA torture report. And I want to thank you both so much for coming together. I, I try to bring uh, people together. I think it makes for like a really good discussion so thank you both for joining me for Organic News. That's going to be played Tuesday, the 25th, on Awake Radio. Good to be here. Thanks for, thanks for making this possible, Captain. Yep, very happy to be here. Okay, so uh, John Kiriakou says he has new information relating to Greece. So we'll start with that. Well, a, a Greek-American blogger with whom I'm, I'm friendly... Uh, told me this morning that the Prime Minister, uh, Alex Tsipras, met privately last night with the Greek president. Uh, the visit was not reported to the press, uh, but the speculation is that the Prime Minister will seek uh, new elections that would likely take place on September the 20th. Uh, this is an attempt, really, by him to purge members of his city's uh, uh, party uh, from Parliament, those members who have opposed his negotiations with the Europeans. So it's going to be a big day for Greece. And I'll tell you, I just got back from Greece a week ago. Tsipras is so popular in Greece that I have to I have to speculate that he would win an absolute majority in this next election for the first time and not have to be in a coalition government with the right of center, center independent Greeks party. So as far as the austerity and all that goes, what what is going to happen? This is the sad thing, though, about Syriza. I admire Syriza's energy. I, I admire the fact that they took to the streets. It's all really great. But when push came to shove, Syriza, just like the conservative and socialist uh, prime ministers before him, ended up towing the European line. And so, um, John Perkins, you, you wrote... Could, an article about um, Greece. I've I've read it on your website. You know that this is a typical corporatocracy. Um, so wh why don't you write like just give your your side of how you see things? Well, I I, I totally agree with John. I think it's it's he's they cave. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that, that Greece is cave, and uh, this is just going to prolong the agony. You know, so they they're, they're getting more loans so they can pay off their past loans and. They've agreed to more austerity. They, they already did this in the late 90s, uh, up until the time of the recent depression that they've been going through. They towed the line. They, they, they adopted uh, austerity programs. They increased their taxes. They cut back on spending. And the work got them. Got them into a depression. Um, now they're agreeing to do it again. And it's, it is interesting to me that, 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 that when the they went through a democratic process a couple of months ago and put the vote out to the people as what they should do, and the people basically said, don't pay, and then they buckled. And now the people seem to be agreeing with it. As John said, it appears that the prime minister is very popular. So well, what does that mean? What does that tell you? It tells you that people are scared to death mm -hmm. of the big central banks. They're scared of the corporatocracy, and they don't know what to do about it. Um, so, right, you, you also said, uh, John, about the countries who did stand up, like Iceland, Ecuador, Argentina, and Brazil. So, I mean, what's wrong with Greece? I mean, why don't they just do the same thing? You know, I think it's... Which job? Oh, I'm Which sorry. Job? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead John. Yeah. I, I, I was going to say, one of, the, one of the sad things about the Greek economy, one of the many sad things about the Greek economy is that it's really not diversified. Greece is almost entirely dependent on tourism. You know, there's a little bit of shipping, a little yeah. bit of olive oil, a little bit of wine, a little bit of mining, um, telecom in Eastern Europe. But really, it's it's a, a tourism-based economy. It's not like Argentina or Brazil, where they actually manufacture things. And I think that that's why the, the Greeks are really afraid of walking away from the banks. I agree, John, with what you said in its entirety. It's a corporatocracy. It's a country uh, managed and run by not just banks, but, but the big international banks, to make it even worse. And there, there's nowhere really that the Greeks can turn. 
John Perkins. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, oh. I had you on mute the, the background noise here. Um, so, yeah, well, but there may be no place that the Greeks can turn except what about China? Really, what about the Chinese banks? I mean, that, that's essentially what Ecuador did quite successfully. So, so when Rafael Correa, the current president of Ecuador, came to power about seven, a little over seven years ago, I mean, this is a guy with a PhD in economics from the University of Illinois, who also has a master's from the University of Belgium. The guy who knows the world, he knows economics, he knows politics. When he came to power, one of the first things he did was appoint a, a debt commission to study Ecuador's debt, and they concluded that $3.5 billion worth of Ecuador's debt was not owed by the Ecuadorian people. It had been taken on in the 70s when I was an economic hitman by, uh, it, by a military dictatorship in Ecuador that made a lot of money off those loans and, and pocketed it essentially or created projects, hired U.S. corporations to build the infrastructure projects that benefited those dictators and economies. And Korea concluded, the commission concluded that Ecuador didn't owe the money. So Korea, Korea defaulted the INF. The World Bank, the World, the, the international financial community, the European and, and U.S. financial communities came after Ecuador, downgraded it, you know, made all kinds of threats. It was Ecuador thing to be, you know, made to pay for this. The Chinese stepped in, gave Ecuador a billion dollar loan, and since then another uh, almost uh, six billion in total, and Ecuador's been paying off the loan, so the credit rating's gone back up. And, you know, and, and who's, who, who's lost out of all of this? The, the U.S. and Europe, because now Ecuador is starting most of its oil to China. It has a very cozy relationship with China, and we're complaining and bitching and hollering and saying, well, Ecuador ought to watch out for China. But basically, we drove them to it. And frankly, if, if, I were, if I were the Greek prime minister right now, I'd be talking very seriously with the Chinese. Well, and I know that they are speaking very seriously with the Russians, and this is what's panicking Washington. Um, you know, it's funny to me, it's always been funny to me, that the State Department, the White House, the Treasury Department, just don't fully appreciate the very long history that Greece and Russia have together. They're both officially Orthodox countries, the only two officially Orthodox Christian countries in the world, where it's actually in the constitutions that um, that they're Orthodox. And... People just don't understand the warmth of, of the relationship. Now, Tsipras went to Russia, I'm going to say it was late June or early July, and the speculation was that he was going to talk to Putin about um, European sanctions, how to, how to get around European sanctions in exchange for a guaranteed loan. I have no idea if that was true. But to be honest with you, I think the Greeks should be talking to the Russians as well as to the Chinese. Yeah, we've got these big new banks that the, the China basically is spearheaded, the BRICS Bank, which includes Russia, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, South Africa, China, um, and, and the AIIB Bank, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Development Bank. Um, China, and, and those, those add up to more money than the World Bank and the IMF, but it's right. combined. Um, and, you know, I think this is very healthy. If I look back to the 70s, when I was big in this business, there was a balance me for us. The Soviet Union, it's in countries like Ecuador or Greece or other countries, began to feel too bullied by the United States and its allies as they would turn to the Soviet Union and even if they didn't end up going to the Soviet Union, it would be a mitigating uh, influence that would make the United States and its allies uh, perhaps soften their, their approach. Yeah. Once the had occurred and then the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, the United States became the only superpower, and we and our banking system and allies with the Europeans uh, strong on these countries, and we treated them very, very poorly. It, it, it just, I was just in Ecuador last week. I just came back a few days ago and, and talking to a minister of state there, a very powerful man, and I, I, know, the, I know the president. They'll tell me things like, well, we'd much rather accept money from China. They've never assassinated our president or our foreign president in Latin America. Coup. They don't have any military base in Latin America. The United States has proven that it's willing to overthrow and assassinate Allende and Arben. Molos and Torrijos and on and on. Um, we know we can't trust the United States. Maybe we can't trust China either. 
but they haven't actually proven that yet. So, so now we'll go with China. And, and I think, you know, frankly, as loyal an American as I am, I, I think this is a healthy thing because I think it's, it's trying to teach a lesson to the World Bank and the IMF who've been extremely abusive ever since they've had, they, 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 they've really uh, manipulated and abused their power. It's that simple, right? Abuse of power and just plain old bullying. It's not really very complicated. And, uh, I mean, Iceland was able to stand up and even jail um, bankers. Yeah, you know, I was in Iceland um, shortly after the depression struck. Well, before the depression struck, I was interviewed for a major Icelandic movie uh, called Dreamlandia and predicted that Iceland would go bankrupt. At the time, I predicted it was the third wealthiest country in the world on the per capita basis. But so it went bankrupt because it built these huge hydroelectric facilities for Alcoa and had a very, very bad contract that saved Alcoa tremendously and other aluminum companies, but primarily Alcoa. I predicted they were going to go bankrupt, and they did. <laughs> they invited me to travel around and encourage people to vote no on the referendum and not to pay off their loans uh, to the Europeans, and they did. Over 90% of the population voted no. And as a result, Iceland actually ended up in really good financial positions and were eventually praised by the president of the, of the World Bank for what they had done. And as you said, uh, they put some of their bankers in jail. Uh, and they, like Ecuador now, have been considering renegotiating some of these loans and saying, well, maybe we'll pay $25, uh, on, uh, 25 cents on the dollar of the loan, but we certainly are not going to pay the whole loan. So, so they, like, like the Korea and Ecuador, are, are they're trying to act reasonable, reasonably and saying, you know, we're, we're really to negotiate. And now we're negotiating from a place of strength rather than a place of weakness. And unfortunately, the Greeks are negotiating from a place of, of weakness. Yeah. yeah, so true. Um, so <laughs> then, does, do either of you, I mean, we, you know, we are discussing it. So, so it basically just comes down to the fact that Greece needs to operate from a place of strength. And, and turn to China or Russia for help? I'm not sure that, that, would be, that, would be, that would be my advice. I mean, it, 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 as, as the other John mentioned, uh, it, they're in a bit of a more difficult situation because they're so heavily dependent on tourism from the United States and other European countries. Uh, but I think that the, the road that they're taking is more austerity and uh, taking more loans to pay off loans is, is, it, it, it's formula for disaster ultimately. It's a short term bandage that will not cure the, the deep wound of the, beneath the surface. John Kiriakou? Yeah, I, I think that's right. I'm not sure I would describe it as a position of strength, but I think at the very least it would afford Greece a little bit of leverage with, with, with which to work, uh, with the Troika. As it stands now, the Troika, and, and the German government are just unwilling to bend in any way. When, when Tsipras last met with, with Merkel uh, before the, um, the referendum, really all he wanted, he didn't ask for a haircut or anything like that. All he really wanted was an extension of the time that Greece had to repay the loans. And Merkel wouldn't even discuss uh, an increase in the length of the repayment schedule. Yeah, it's just, uh, so that's what I'm saying. When you acquiesce to bullies, they just bully you even more. And, you know, well, well the, the Germans particularly, it's, 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 I find it absolutely yeah. outrageously disgusting that here's a country that basically at the end of World War II, the, we, the rest of the, the Allies, uh, forgave about 50% of their loans and, and, and a pretty low interest rate and very good terms on the other 50%, even though that debt had been used to incinerate people and others to commit genocide and to conduct a war against all of us. But, but we, we still, I, I think, uh, the United States and, and its, its allies recognize the importance of, of treatment and, and giving a country a chance to recover, and of course they recovered spectacularly as a result. Well, Greece deserves the same chance, and, and to see Germany now 
bully angry, so after the tremendous gifts it received, and granted, World War II was a long time ago, but it's, it was precedent setting, and it worked for Germany. It brought them back on the TV economically. So it, it certainly appears that the Germans are smart enough to know that what they're doing is crushing Greece. And, and it appears that that's what they want to do. So you, you got to look, what's, what's the real motive here? It certainly isn't to build the Greek economy, because Germans are smart enough to know the better way to do that. And so, what, I mean, what if Greece just, right, did not pay this loan back? I'm, I mean, what's going to happen? I mean, they, they can't do it. It's, it, it's you know, it, it's... Just mathematically impossible, really. Well, they're, they're doing it by taking on more loans. If they didn't do that, they would be pushed out of the European Union, or they, out of the Eurozone, let's say. And um, they, they don't want that. I mean, they don't think that their banks then would be in a very, very difficult position. They don't want that. I, I think that's why I suggest that they go to China or Russia or a combination of the two or the BRICS bank, which already involves those two countries. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, to not pay off the loans at all and not be in a position to negotiate a reduction in their loans or 30 cents on the dollar or something like that uh, means that, that probably their banking system would collapse. I think mean, that's what they faced a, a month or two ago. And I've lost track of time. I was in the Amazon for a bit too long. But, but they, they, they saw it as coming when they, when, they, when they passed the referendum, but they weren't going to pay these things off. And then the, the threat was that they would be, that, that they would be dropped from the euro. They have to create their own currency. Their banks were, were essentially sold, and that was terrifying to them. And maybe John has some, some more thoughts on that. It, it is terrifying to them. You know, it's funny to me. I, I spent a lot of time with, with CISA government officials when I was in Greece last week. And... Syriza is not talking about about walking away. I mean, even even the the most left wing activists in places like Exarchia or at the universities are not talking about walking away. And I think it's because they they believe that if they do walk away, um, there won't be any way that they can that they can finance government programs like any government programs. And so I think that what people are hoping for and holding out for is this haircut that you keep hearing about, that the Troika finally agrees that, okay, yes, this debt is untenable, the Greeks can't pay it, they can't pay it in a hundred years, and so we're going to cut it, you know, in half, or we're going to cut a third of it off, for whatever, and allow the Greeks to start digging their way out. I think that's what people are hoping for, but um, so far, they're not getting any satisfaction. They're not winning on any point so far. John, why do you think that Germans are being so intransigent? What, 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 what do you think is the motive behind Merkel, behind the, the German policy here? The, the Germans and the Greeks have always had a difficult relationship. I mean, putting aside even the, the horrors of the Second World War, I mean, what the Germans did in Greece is, is the stuff of nightmares and history books. Um, but I think that these new Germans, these post-World War II Germans are just so corporate and so efficient that they resent Greece's inefficiency and Greece's independence with a small I. You know, Greece very much is an Eastern country. It's not a Western country at all. It has a lot more in common with places like Turkey or Syria or, you know, Israel than it does with, with Germany and Belgium and the UK. And I think that the Germans don't understand and don't appreciate the Eastern mentality and the Greeks don't understand why the Germans just can't lend a helping hand. They and they're talking past each other. There wouldn't be a possibility of, I don't know, anybody um, being behind Germany and coercing them to be doing this would there I'm just a thought well, John knows the big banks better than I do I'll, I'll refer to him well, well you know yeah it, it, it's a no brainer that that's what the United States ought to be doing but we're not doing it and, because, and why I think because with the United States right now took a very strong stance against the, uh, having anybody in, in Europe joining the, the Asian infrastructure investment 
uh, bank, the AIIB, uh, the, the European Union has not did it. The United States has taken a strong stance of, of opposing China around the world and seeing China as, as an enemy rather than as a as kind of a boost to competition to make everything better for everyone, which, is, which would be another way to look at it. And, and so I think the United States has just totally backed off this and, and given it to into Germany and, and France, um, and, and I think it's it, it's a terrible shame. But I think the point John brought up of the difference in cultures is a very very important one. The, 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 the Greek culture and the Greek approach to economics are so different than the German and from much of the rest of Europe. And in fact, that that, that I think could be a problem further out with, with the, the whole Eurozone. And, and, and let's also not forget that another thing that's driving the Germans is that they don't want Greece to set a precedent for countries like Portugal and Spain and Italy and Ireland and follow. And all of those countries, too, have a very different approach to life than the Germans. Uh, so I think the Germans are, 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 are desperately trying to, to stop, to stop the you know, and the, 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 the little hole in the dam, which is pretty, knowing that if that hole opens up, it could become very large. So, I mean, um, is it possible then that Greece just really has to kind of, you know, bear down then and, and go through it and, and allow their economy to collapse it and, and withdraw from the European Union? And, and, and be willing to go through the pain to come out maybe on the other side? Either, either, John? Well, well as I said, I, I think another alternative would be to bring the Chinese yeah. or, or the Russians or a combination of the two. I, I, I don't know. Maybe something I don't understand as to why that's not happening, but it certainly it worked for Ecuador um, pretty well. And, and I don't know, and maybe John has, has some thoughts on, on, on why they're not going to you, 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 John, oh, you already said, John, I think that you know that they, they, met, they met with Putin, and uh, you don't know what happened there. But, but it, 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 it's, it's strange to me that they haven't gone that route at all. And I don't know why they wouldn't. That's what I, that's what I would do, and that's just something I don't understand that they know. I don't know what that would be, though. You know, I don't know. I think it's probably more a fear of the unknown than of anything else. The, the Greeks have, have so latched on to the euro as their currency, which is funny to me because I was actually living in Greece when the country switched from the, the drachma to the euro. And people were actually very, very upset about losing the drachma. They had used the drachma for 2,500 years and they were just pushing it aside for the euro. Now the opposite is true. They're, they're petrified at the idea of losing the euro and of having to reintroduce a currency that's really useless on the international market. So I think it's the sphere of the unknown more than anything else. So um, I think, how about if we move a little bit along? Um, John Kiriakou, you said you wanted to um, discuss with John Perkins the topic of Jeffrey Sterling. Um, well, not just with John, but with you as well. Okay. Uh, Jeffrey Sterling is, as I'm sure you know, the CIA whistleblower who um, was recently convicted of, wow, something like seven counts of espionage and two counts of theft of government property, which was classified information, um, because of a story that he allegedly provided to Jim Rising from the New York Times. So Jeffrey, Jeffrey was facing 45 years in prison. He ended up getting three and a half. And um, I've spoken to his wife a number of times recently, his wife, Holly. Uh, Jeffrey is, he, he reported to prison about a month ago. And the Bureau of Prisons, and this is what they do. They did it to me. They do it to everybody who, who is high profile. They transferred him to a prison um, 1,200 miles from home just so it would be difficult for him to receive visitors. And indeed, it's been practically impossible for him to receive visitors. As a result, he's so depressed oh that um, that he's possibly suicidal. Uh, he wrote an open letter to uh, civil rights uh, groups, mostly African-American groups, um, that was published in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch about a week ago. It was picked up by the Huffington Post and really has taken on a life of its own on the Internet. 
Um, but it's it's very angry and it's very sad. And he wants to know where have these groups been for him and for his case? Why didn't they support him? Why didn't they help him? You know, he's the only black man who's been accused of these crimes ever. Um, he's the only he's the only black man who um, who the CIA has has fired after filing a racial discrimination suit against the organization, and they didn't deny racial discrimination. They simply told the judge that in order to defend themselves, they would have to expose classified information, and so the judge dismissed the case outright on national security grounds. So Jeffrey really is, in my view, the, the forgotten national security whistleblower. He kept quiet in, in, the, in the many years, it was five years that his case was pending, he kept quiet all those years, stayed out of the press so as not to anger the judge. And it didn't make a darn bit of difference. And I just want to raise his case and say we need to pull together for this poor guy. We need to, to talk about him and tweet and Facebook about his case and about his situation and ensure that he knows that he's not forgotten. And, uh, tr yeah, try to get the Black Lives Matter people <laughs> in his corner. I mean, you know, they, they stood up and got on stage and interrupted Bernie Sanders. Um, yeah. That would have been a good opportunity to speak on his behalf, too, right there. Yeah, that's right. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll de I mean, I'll definitely, uh, you know, d start doing that. I mean, I, I know a lot of people involved and the people that I do know, I mean, I'll definitely mention him to it. And it, if, you know, if they're not aware of the details, I mean, we could try to arrange some kind of, uh, again, um, you know, information to get them, to get them more privy to the details of exactly you know, who he is and what happened to him. Yeah. Yeah. So John, do you, uh, do you have any in in inclination? I mean, one of Sterling's expertise, his area originally was Persia, uh, Iran. Um, yes. Do you think this is playing a factor here with, you know, what's going on right now in Iran? Is there something, is there something else that's going on behind the scenes that we don't understand? It hasn't kept come out that's been involved the whole situation with Iran? Uh, it, that's certainly possible. Um, I, I'm not sure there's a direct connection, just because I I never really, I never followed uh, Iran as a CIA officer, but um, but that's entirely possible. You know, the thing is... Yeah, I mean, I mean the whole thing with Iran right now is, is, is so extremely disturbing that, you know, we can't... Uh, you know, we get a couple of key Democrats now that are, that are opposing the president and right. his uh, attempt, attempt to strike a deal with Iran because Iran won't, won't completely get rid of all sort of nuclear capabilities. And yet, right. here the country, Iran, surrounded <laughs> by nuclear war and well, many of which we have control over, you know. Uh, and it's just totally surrounded by nuclear warheads, and 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 we're saying we can't even you know have any nuclear facilities at all. It's it's it's, it's, it's an interesting aspect of our foreign policy. You're absolutely right, absolutely right. And another point I wanted to raise about Jeffrey's case is Jeffrey did what Tom Drake did when when he had a problem with policy when he believed that that a CIA operation was in violation of the law. He did exactly what he was supposed to do. He complained to his chain of command. When he didn't get satisfaction there, he went to the inspector general. When he didn't get satisfaction there, he went to the oversight committees. And the only evidence that was used against him in court, and this is what was most disturbing to me, the only evidence that was used against him in court was metadata showing that he had called Jim Risen or Jim Risen had called him on numerous occasions. There were no recordings. There were no emails. There were no text messages. So we don't have any idea what the two of them talked about. But the CIA concluded that that information in Risen's book, State of War, had to have come from Jeffrey because Jeffrey was one of like 120 people who had access to the information. So although mm -hmm. there was no specific evidence to indicate that he had ever provided Ryzen with that information, he was the only one who was prosecuted. 
How that mm-hmm. verdict was not set aside is an utter mystery to me. Although I shouldn't even say that because his judge was my judge. And not only does she have a reputation as being a hanging judge, but she's a hanging judge in what's called the Espionage Court, the toughest national security court in America in the Eastern District of Virginia. Mm. It's a hell of a tale. Yeah. I'm sorry, John Perkins, what did you say? I said it's a hell of a story. I mean, it, 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 it just seems to me, I mean, again, like they're, they're going to get the outcome that they want to get. You know, ir- irregardless of laws or facts or evidence, you know, I mean, it just seems to be the, you know, the M.O. It's just like the way the way they roll. Um, I wanted to kind of bring up also, um, uh, you know, Obama, you know, I wanted to further go into the discussion about torture, um, John Kiriakou, you know, that, that you exposed and your article recently, you know, talking about, uh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to read this one part of what you wrote. They intend to repeat a lie over and over again, um, in the book that torture worked. They hope that the American people are either so gullible or so stupid that they'll believe it. It's up to the rest of us to ensure that our government swears off committing this crime against humanity. Um, the CIA's torture era leadership won't repent. Even after the select co- committee on intelligence released its report saying in no uncertain terms that the CIA had tortured its prisoners, that torture was official U.S. government policy, and that torture never elicited any actionable intelligence that saved American lives. Uh, Bush-era CIA directors George Tennant, Porter Goss, Michael Hayden, and several of the underlings announced plans to release a book justifying torture. So, I mean, there's kind of your answer. I mean, they're just, they're going to drive home you just you know completely running over facts and evidence to get what they want mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. this is this is just a big lie it's really as simple as that it's a big lie that these guys repeat over and over again to anyone who will listen and they're so upset by a senate torture report that was written using primary source CIA documents, primary source documents. This information came from the horse's mouth. They're so upset about the conclusions that they've decided to write this book to perpetuate their own lie. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so disgusted by this that I purposely did not mention the title of the book, the publisher, or that it's already out there and it's already been published because I didn't want to point people to it. Yeah, and and John, I would just like to say, you know, I, I, I tremendously admire your courage for what for what you did as a whistleblower and, and served time for doing it, um, and just a deep respect for that. I, it, it, you know, it's it must be a, 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 a terrifying thing to face awesome. the prospect of going to. <laughs> going to a U.S. prison and, you know, and, and standing up to the U.S. government, especially to the CIA. And I just I have great admiration for your courage in taking that on. Thank you very, very much, Sean. I really appreciate that. I'll, I'll tell you the truth. It was, it, the last three and a half years have been utterly surreal. I, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, truly. But okay. I like to think that I came out of it a stronger and, and more focused person. Mm-hmm. And how are you feeling about your government right now? I'm disgusted and disappointed. And, you know, to make matters worse, I know a lot of these guys personally. I mean, I worked for John Kerry for two and a half years. I know him personally. He ran for the hills when I was arrested. And I, I reached mm-hmm. out to him through by writing to his, to his private email, which, you know, I was one of only four senior staff members who had it. And he just ignored me. Um, I have dear friends at senior levels in government who have sent messages through through um, friends we have in common saying, I wish you the best, buddy. Good luck. 
I hope you understand that I can never speak to you again. You know, <laughs> stuff like that. Hey, yeah. Cowards. You know, there was a book in a movie called, what was it called? Came from the cold with Richard Burton many years ago. You were thrown out into the cold. You were thrown under the bus. That's, that's what it was. I was thrown right under the bus. But that's okay. You know, my wife said way back in 2012, they've always underestimated you. You're a lot tougher than they think you are. And, and I am. I'm a lot tougher than they think I am. They thought this would silence me. And all it did was it made me more vocal. Can I, you. Yeah. I, I wanted to bring up, because this really irks the hell out of me, I have to say, was when the president, quote, um, decided to ignore um, the officer's violations of the law and say, turn around and say, oh, let's look forward. You know, you know, in, in, in as opposed to holding people accountable for torture. Meanwhile, the g- prisons in this country are filled with people committing virtual non crimes and being held in solitary confinement to the point that when they get out, they commit suicide. Yes. Yeah, they do. He doesn't they commit suicide. He doesn't say. Why doesn't he say to the to the you know, the, the marginalized people or, you know, the, the people being grinded up in this meat grinder. Oh, let's look forward and overlook the complete pettiness. I mean, you have police completely brutalizing people for, for nothing. Eric Garner, I'm just, you know, throwing the name out. Selling yeah. Lu- Lu- Lucy cigarettes and they execute the guy right there on the sidewalk. That's right. It's, it's scary as hell. It's disgusting. And we're still claiming to be the world's great democracy and we're anything but, you know, I mean, our, um, our elected officials no longer represent people. They, we elect them, but they then represent the corporations that finance their campaigns and they're going to hire them as consultants at huge salaries after they leave Congress. Um, we get police forces out on the streets that think nothing of shooting people just because they, I don't know, <laughs> all kinds of different motives. The drones, the spying, the cameras everywhere, you know, I'm not really listening to, to this, this, uh, this interview, our, our phones, if they, if they deem us, uh, worthy of being but they may not anymore. Who knows? But uh, they have that ability. It's, it's terrifying. It's, it's totally Orwellian. It's, it's, I think, worse than anything Orwell ever anticipated in 1984. Uh, it, and, it's, and it's getting worse and worse, and yet we still hold ourselves out to be this great democracy. We want the teachers in Florida, Nebraska to swear an allegiance to, uh, the best, to the best country on the planet, which just, uh, it, I mean, if this is the best country on the planet, God help the species. Exactly. Arctic. Well, this is where the, the, you know, the psychology really comes in, and the denial of, you know, people just completely you know, not wanting to accept the, the reality of what's happening. And mm-hmm. it's that denial that's going to really screw them in the end. And why for decades, I mean, um, I, I just, I really want to just bring up, um, I don't know if you're familiar uh, with, with Mark Passio. He's got a website called whatonearthishappening.com. And like you, John Perkins, he kind of was on the dark side and, and he sort of turned, you know, whistleblower. And, you know, what he talks about is really, really interesting. I would kind of, you know, encourage both of you to, 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 to look him up. Um, anyway, it's, uh, you know, we, we, we get into a lot of the psychology of, of what's going on and, Exactly. I mean, it's and and how the the system has really become the parent of people. That you know, it's hard to accept the fact that you know they're not in your best interest. Any any uh, comments or how you know? So to, to get how do we get the public to you know accept? the reality and exercise there. Well, we don't, 
We don't need the entire public to accept it. We need, right. put, you know, the, the critical mass, whatever that is. Yeah. I think that's what we're doing, and yeah. I think we're working on it. And, and frankly, as I travel around the world and, and this country and speak at universities and so forth, I do see an awakening. I think people, I think university students are, are, are getting it, and they're not quite sure what to do about it. I've got a new book coming out in, in February. Which, which I could probably be kind of the book is that it's an outline path people can take to turn this around. Because I think there's an awful lot of people that now are getting it. And the, the problem is they're not sure what to do about it. Right. They realize the, the corporations that are, are the power behind all of this. Let's face it, it's, it's, we have a global empire. It's not really an American empire. It's, it's a global empire, in my opinion. The CIA, and John, you may have other thoughts on this, but the CIA, the Pentagon, U.S. government essentially works with big corporations supporting them around the world, and yet the big corporations have to be supported by us, the consumers. Uh, so in a way, you can say that although our country is no longer a democracy, I'm not sure if it really was a democracy. In fact, I'm pretty sure it never, never was, but I think it was headed in that direction, and now it's taking many steps backward. Uh, but the marketplace is a democracy. If we choose to use it as such, if we get rid of apartheid by... Uh, boycott corporations that supported it in South Africa. We get corporations to clean up rivers in this country that were terribly polluted, one of them on fire with pollution, yeah. by boycotting them if they didn't do so. Uh, you know, we get corporations to open the doors much wider to women and minorities. Uh, equal pay is still not there, but, but we've come a long way from when I was in business school, for example, shortly after the other John was born. I, I was in business school in the late 60s. Um, and, and there were no women uh, in you know, top executive positions there are today. I mean, as I say, we're still a ways to go. But, but we've made some progress in these areas, and usually we've made it because we put the pressure on corporations that then have put pressure on the politicians that they own. And today, more than ever, they own politics. Um, I, I'm just going to bring up the, um, you know, the recent... Mm -hmm approval of Obama to, to allow Shell to drill in the Arctic. What What is either one of your feelings on that? I mean, exactly. I mean, instead of him curtailing and preserving these pristine environments, they say the risk of a spill is about 70%. There's a book that came out recently, Kat, um, well, recently, 2000. Uh, 13, written by um, Halpern and Heilman, two eminent Washington political journalists. And it was about the 2012 uh, presidential election, not just the general election between Obama and Romney, but the primaries as well. And there, there were two quotes that they attribute to President Obama that were shocking. And one is really directly applicable to what we're talking about right now, where he said to an aide, um, about complaints that uh, he had abandoned the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. He said, I never told anybody I was a progressive. And I think that's really the root of so many of our problems with this administration, is that whether overtly or covertly, he sold the Democratic Party a bill of goods that hope and change were real, that he was different, this was going to be a new kind of presidency, and it turned out to just be a lie. Yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing. It's, um, right? But, uh, you, you know, I agree with that, and I also think that if the Obama presidency has pointed out to us that the president really is somewhat irrelevant. I, I, I believe that today the President of the United States doesn't have much power, except in some fairly small areas. And, and in a way, Obama is executing some of those now. Um, but the corporations have the control. And the, the President is very, very vulnerable, and not just because of campaign financing and the fact you go to deal with Congress and, and over 100,000 lobbyists, many of which are not registered lobbyists, but in essence they are lobbyists. Uh, and in addition to that, the president and any top leader today knows that they can be assassinated without a bullet, political assassination. So 
in Kennedy's time, it took a bullet. You know, it, 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 everybody knew he was having affairs with lots of women, and nobody really cared. By the time Clinton came around, he could assassinate the president politically uh, with the sex scandal, and not much of one at that. And I think, you know, Obama's very aware that he's in an extremely vulnerable position. And I think John would, would agree with me as a former CIA agent that, that even if, if somebody doesn't have any skeletons in this closet, which is pretty hard to believe, but even if he didn't, um, the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, whoever can create them and get them out to the press. And, and, and our leaders know that they're extremely vulnerable. And I think that's something we often forget. We think that, you know, all we need to do is elect Obama's uh, uh, an African American, a woman, Bernie Sanders. I, I love Bernie Sanders and I love his campaign, but, but I gotta say, you know, if he becomes president, I, I doubt that we'll be able to do very much of what he wants to do, or the promise to do, even if he doesn't want to do it, he just he won't get away with it. Yeah. But I hope I'm, I hope I'm wrong in that way. Like, I hope he does get elected, I hope he does everything he, he, he says he wants to do. <laughs> I'd be shocked if that happened, you know, totally shocked. I'd be, I'd be incredibly happy to be shocked, but I, I don't believe it would happen because it's so, the system is so overwhelmingly tough. I um, We have just over, like just under actually 15 minutes. Um, I thought I would bring up uh, and mention, you know, Eric Holder and him saying that the, the, the banks were too big to jail you know, those words coming out of the mouth of the, at the time, you know, attorney general who then went back to the law firm that is in cahoots with those very bankers. Anybody have yeah. a... Yeah. Go ahead. Well, it's, you know, it's fascinating. And not just American banks, but some of the world's biggest banks in, in Europe. Uh, the reason they've been fined over $10 billion for reading LIBOR, the the, the 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 indexing of the uh, interest indexing system and also for rigging the uh, currency exchange systems they've been fined over ten billion dollars and not a single banker has been indicted or held responsible in any way so banks don't commit crimes people within the bank commit crimes but but nobody's been taken down and you know Hall is a great example of the revolving door of this. Uh, uh, you know, what I'm saying, somebody is he's, he's back in private practice. And this is the guy who, incidentally, uh, um, you know, defended uh, Chiquita, or was it, uh, oh, I think it was Chiquita in, Chiquita in, in Colombia, before, just, just before he became attorney general. And, uh, and Chiquita was found guilty in Colombia of participating in assassinations and being on, being on the list of of subversive organizations, uh, and Holder was, was defending them. And then when Zelaya was overthrown president of Honduras in a CIA coup, uh, because of Chiquita and Dole, because they didn't like Zelaya, so I'm sorry, I'm getting into the details, but it was overthrown. Of course, the Obama administration is now has Holder, the attorney general, is in an extremely awkward position. Their attorney general has been a former hit man. Uh, for, for Chiquita. Uh, and now he's back out there doing it and sending the banker. Yeah, that's the revolving door. It's, it's huge corruption. I just came from Ecuador and spent a lot of time in countries that we all say, oh my God, they're so corrupt. And it's like, look like my, yeah, you may have to pay someone to get something through customs. You slide, you slide, you know, a, a, a hundred dollar bill under the table to them. And that's corruption. But in the United States, we may not have to do that. We have corruption on such a huge level, and, and it's legalized. So legally speaking, it isn't corruption, but it is. It's legal corruption. It's, it's legalized crime. We have it on a huge level in this country, bigger than anywhere else in the world. And it's, you know, it's so blatant. I mean, it's so in your face what Eric Holder is doing. And, you know, I'm... where's the revolution, I keep asking? <laughs> where's the revolution? Where's the uprising? And, and don't forget that Eric Holder also uh, went on to a six million dollar a year job at uh, Covington and Burley. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's and that's where he had been when he defended Shakira. Uh, that's right. And, 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 and he went back there after serving as Attorney General. And there again, that's a revolving door. You know, we, we put people in these positions, 
because uh, I suppose when they watch the organizations that they used to work for, it happens in the oil companies, or it happens in the big or it happens in Wall Street, you know, Goldman Sachs. So we take people out of these companies, put them in the position of watch selling those companies, and then they go back to work for those companies. What do you think they're going to do? Duh. That's right. Right. That's, that's exactly the point, too. And that's exactly what's wrong with this government. Yep. So we have, um, we're going into our last 10 minutes and there are two um, topics I, I, I just wanted to make sure that I get in. Um, and being that we're one less than a month away from 9-11 and the uh, catalyst for all of these never-ending wars, I, I, I thought I would get, um, you know, just bring that up and throw it out there and see what, you know, either of your, um, I mean, you know, John Perkins, I know that you, you question the official story. Yes, I certainly question it. I, I don't know what the real story is. I don't pretend to know, but it's very, very difficult for me to accept the official version. Uh, and, you know, it's frankly, one big reason is the Pentagon, which was hit, and we've never actually seen any real photographs of an airplane or airplane wreckage, and no general officer's job. I mean, when the nation's number one fortress gets attacked and has a huge hole in it, you expect uh, someone to lose their job. No, 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 no planes were mustered. No, nothing happened. The whole thing is extremely, extremely suspicious to me. Oh, I'll, I'll go you one, one better. At the CIA, and it's really September 11th was, was the greatest intelligence failure in the history of the United States. And at the CIA, not only did nobody lose their jobs, but all the major players uh, were promoted. Every last one of them. Exactly. I, um, I mean, again, like, I, I don't know how far I go as far as, like, how the... I, I mean, I definitely believe that this country allowed it to happen in some way. You know, where I draw the line, again, that's, like, a different story. Um, but there's going to be... Um, the anniversary, the 14th anniversary, there's going to be a lot of good events here in New York City that I, of course, I'm going to be filming and documenting. Um, and so the, the next thing I wanted to bring up, um, John Perkins, you said you're doing another Confessions of an Economic Hitman Part 2, and you're going to be talking about things that were not um, put in the first book. Do you mind sharing some of that? Or is well, it? in particular, in particular, yes, I'm going to be talking about some of the things back then, but also particularly what's happened since the book came out in 2004, uh, which I and, I and things have gotten a lot worse. And the economic hit men have come home to roost. I mean, we've seen that, and all the death that's been taken on in this country by people in the recession, and and, and so on. So I, I go a lot into that, but I also I, I really I'm glad to have the opportunity to have that. To mention this, and I, I, I like. I think we should leave this program on a, on a positive note. That I think people like like John and, and you and, and a lot of people out there now speaking out, and and I am feeling around this country and around the world that there's, there's a consciousness revolution. People are waking up, and so far they haven't really decided what actions to take. But the first step is to wake up, and I really feel that that is happening despite the incredible control of the mainstream media by the big corporations, and that's what very little gets into the mainstream media, there's a tremendous amount of alternative media like like what we're doing right now. And I think this is very healthy. I'm extremely hopeful, and I encourage listeners not to get depressed, not to give up, not to just you know, say, oh, my God, it's just, it's just it's too awful, but instead to really look at what we can do to change it and to understand that the, the, the power base is the big corporations, and they are dependent on you. The consumer, they depend on all of us, and they bend uh, when we come together with consumer action. When we come together, when we really get the message out there. So, uh, you know, I, I just want to encourage people uh, not to get lethargic because that's what they want you to do to be lethargic. Think it's nothing you can do about the best country in the world. It may not be for but that's just bull. You know, we can do something. We can change it. We can we can make a better world. At least don't give up until we've you know. D done something, you know. I mean, because the people, don't ever get up, <laughs> right? The people do have the power; they just don't realize it. They, I, I believe, the people are are because they've never had it before. They kind of can get afraid of their own power. 
That you know they're so right. they, they've been so conditioned right. to 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 sur- surrender power over to someone else, and and to now own that power and be in the driver's seat. You know, it just takes a little getting used to. Right. So, in answer to your question, there's the book, which is the title of the New Confessions of Economic Dynamics, coming out in February, is really going to address that as how we have the power and we've got to use it. And, and it, it, it points up all the things that really got worse in 2004 and how that ought to be the, the, the catalyst to push us to the action. Um, John Kiriakou, did you, do you have anything to. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, we're, we're up against a stacked deck with corporate ownership of, of most all of the media. And all we can do is to keep fighting. There's a very robust uh, alternative media, uh, something that until I got in trouble, I didn't even realize existed. And, and now it's the sole source of my news is the alternative media and uh, Al Jazeera pretty much and Twitter. Uh, so that's all we can do is keep fighting and keep struggling and and know that in the end we'll finally educate enough people that there will be real change. Um, just lastly, I wanted to kind of squeeze in. We have like four minutes left. Um, the the GOP with Chris Christie and Rand Paul on the Bill of Rights, and I was actually pretty surprised that Chris Christie stood there and literally admitted uh, that we need to violate the rights of the people in order to protect their rights. Spoken like a true prosecutor, which is exactly what he was. He was a federal prosecutor. And you know, this is another thing, too. It points to a broader problem. Almost every federal judge in America, almost every single one, is a former prosecutor. So how does anybody get a fair shake here? How does anybody get a fair interpretation of the Constitution you know, when their very lives are at stake, when everybody you're up against is a prosecutor or a former prosecutor. I would never in a million years vote for a prosecutor. I don't care how progressive he claims to be. You know, Christie professes to be a moderate. There's nothing moderate but no moderate about Chris Christie when he's talking about uh, abrogating the Constitution. And he, um, he kind of benefited out of uh, putting away the, the Fort Dix Five, these... Um, you know, guys that were just out hunting who, you know, they, they thought or he wanted to be terrorists or whatever it was that, I mean, there's a, a movie, I think it's called Terror with a T in parenthesis about the Duca brothers. Yeah, it was just five idiots who, who were out. <laughs> uh, it, it, the FBI does this kind of thing all the time. It, it did it with the Cleveland, uh, whatever they were, the Cleveland Three or the Cleveland Five that wanted to blow up the Route 82 bridge. Well, they, they were just a couple of idiots sitting in a bar, and an FBI uh, a rat approached them and said, hey, yeah. you guys, you know what we should do is we should blow up the Route 82 bridge. They said, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Well, the, it was the FBI that created that conspiracy. Yeah, the And we see this kind of thing all the time. I mean, these, these terrorist plots that the FBI keeps foiling, they're created by the FBI. Right. I call it genetic modification, you know, like they're genetically modifying, like, I mean, literally, I don't know, I mean, what else to call it? Like these, you know, because, I mean, even Bill Binney said the same thing about the NSA. They they get more money by, by creating the problems and perpetuating. Sure, t- and this is how people get promoted in government. Oh, let's promote uh, Joe Blow over here. He uh, foiled a terrorist attack in Cleveland. It's crazy. Well, no, he created the terrorist attack in Cleveland <laughs> and then foiled it. Isn't that, it's, what, what is that, there's a medical term for that where uh, a nurse or a doctor will uh, try to kill or, I don't know, make a person sick so that then they can turn around and save them. Yeah. I think that's. Munchausen. Yeah, right. (laughs) That's it. Um, Okay, so does anybody have any last burning things to share? Chelsea Manning. I would just, I, I would just say to both of you, keep up the great work. You know, I mean, oh, it's it's you. people and letting, letting people know that that change is, is on the way. It's, it's the tide is turning, and we need to keep turning it harder and harder and taking action. So thank you, John Perkins. Look out for his um, Confessions mm-hmm. of an Economic Hitman Part Two. Sorry, what was the the exact title? 
the new confession of an economic And John Kiriak. Go, go to my website, johnperkins.org, and I'll bet, I'll bet John, you've got a website too. You can go to and sign up your newsletter or whatever. That's right. Yep, I've got johnkiriaki.com, and, uh, and I'm proud to say that, that later this afternoon, at 2.30 Eastern Time this afternoon, the uh, Penn Center is going to announce that they're awarding me their annual uh, Penn First Amendment Award for a series of blogs that I did from prison on prison life and prison reform. And I'm John Curiel. Congratulations. Thank you very much. You know what's really well, crazy? What, 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 what was that website again? Uh, uh, it's it's johnkiriaku.com. John, K-I-R-I-A-K-O-U.com. The crazy thing is previous previous winners of this award are these giants like Ray Bradbury and Gore Vidal and Christopher Hitchens and Glenn Greenwald. And I thought, what in the world are they doing with me? Jeez, oh man. But it's a real honor. They're showing you that you're a giant too and mm -hmm. believe it. And, and, keep, keep, and, keep, and keep growing. Keep, keep, keep gianting. Ah, oh, thank you. I've just begun to fight. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Yeah, thank both of you. Thank you so much, John Kiriakou and John Perkins. Have a good day. You too. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.